Okay, so our first question has us defining a function, check animals, that consumes a list of strings representing the names of animals and produces whether either dog or cat is in the list. So we're going to have this function consuming a list of animals. Let's take a look at what that looks like. When we're creating a list, we use the square brackets, and that creates a empty list. If I evaluate it, it's just empty. I can put values inside that list, and they could be integers. So like here's a list of uh, five numbers right here. Or I could have four numbers, or I could put a whole bunch more numbers inside that list. It expands to fill however many values I give it. So it's, it's a very flexible kind of thing, because we can put a lot of different types of things in there. Now this question says we're going to put animals in there, and, and animals being encoded as strings. So we might have gerbil, and hamster, and snake, and dog. So like that right there, that's a list of strings. Uh, the first value is gerbil, followed by hamster, then snake, and then dog. Okay? If I store that in a variable called, like, say, animals, then if I look at one of them using list indexing, I can look at the first one, and that gets me gerbil. Or I can look at the second one, that's hamster. So this is just like how we could access elements of a string, characters of a string, using the square brackets, but now we're using it to access the elements of a list. Turns out we can actually do uh, negative indexes and subscript notation to get out ranges of them. So that, you see, produces a, another list of strings from the first one. <clears throat> so lists very similar in concept to strings, except they can be composed of other things, possibly strings, possibly integers. Many different kinds of types could be put inside of a list, which is pretty cool, pretty powerful that we can combine data and allows us to access, uh, allows us to process much more complicated forms of information. So looking at this question in particular, it says that we're going to be uh, defining this function. So we're going to need our import assert equal in order to unit test the function. And we're going to call check animals passing in a list of animals. If we do so, uh, passing in, say, this list of animals over here, so if I go and grab that list and replace it here, we could say that that list does have a dog in it. So that produces true, right? We're checking whether or not dog or cat is in the list. Let's make another list. This time, we'll get rid of the gerbil and the dog in this test case. So now we have hamster and snake, neither of which is cat or dog. So that would be false. If we replaced the snake with a cat, however, then it would be true, because if we have either cat or dog, and if they were both dogs, and just for color we'll add in a dog, cat, dog, then that would be true. We'll do one more interesting case, and that one is the empty case, the empty list, which is just a pair of square brackets. The empty list does not have dog or cat in it, so it also produces false. Now, as always, if we run it right now, it's going to fail because we haven't actually defined check animals. I'm just helping you understand what it will look like once we have defined it and we have it available to call. So you can call check animals on any one of these. In terms of actually defining this function, we're, we're going to take advantage of a the in operator. So previously, we saw how we could ask, like, hey, is letter A in Harry Potter? And the answer was, yes, it is true. Well, if we have a bunch of animals, oh, I called it uh, animals, didn't I? Oh, I rerun the program, so I have to bring it back. There we go. If I have animals stored in a list, right? Gerbil, hamster, snake, dog. I can ask a question like, hey, are gerbils in the animals list? Yeah, yes, they are. Is snake in the animals list? Yes, they are. What about snake, all caps? Ah, that one's not. It's very specific, right? It says that, OK, it does have the uh, lowercase animal snake, but not the uppercase snake. Um, and of course, if we asked it for something like, say, uh, badger, that's definitely not in animals, so it'd be false. Now, we can leverage this in operator, just like we did for strings, to uh, answer this question fairly easily. We write our function, check animals. It consumes uh, a list of animal names. So we might call this animal names. 
might also just call it names or animals, but I like animal names to be very clear and explicit what this function is passing in. And then we've got to write the type, the type of this parameter. It's not a string, right? It's more complicated than that because it's a list of strings. So we put square brackets around it to indicate that this is a list of strings. Now, once we want to return something, it's a Boolean in this case, right? We're returning either true or false. And that's the header right there. Then we got to define the body of the function. Uh, now, you might be inclined to try and write return dog or cat in animal names. It, it sounds good, right? Like this is how we'd write it in English. It's what I wrote up there. Dog or cat is in the list. And that's what this almost would seem to translate to. But it turns out it's actually more complicated than that. We're failing all of our test cases because or is not distributive. Just like we saw last week, we have to be very uh, precise with our question. We have to say if dog in animal names or cat in animal names, almost as if there were parentheses around it, right? Otherwise, it tries to say uh, something not quite correct. So once we have the code written out, and I don't need the parentheses, I was just using there to help you understand how it groups it. But once I have it, I believe I pass all my test cases. Yes, yes, I do. Excellent. Very good. Uh, you see that we're now returning either true or false, depending on which values were in the list. And, you know, I define this function. So now I could actually call the function check animals, dog, cat, badger, uh, mole. Hard to think of animals on the fly. If I called it, then that would produce true. If I called it with a list of animals that didn't have it, it would be false. Things to keep out an eye out for, there are square brackets here, right? Whenever we want to make a list, we need those square brackets. Whenever we want to make a list. Now, square brackets are also used for list indexing and subscripting and for string indexing and subscripting. Very confusing, but you just got to keep seeing lots of code and hopefully you kind of get a feel for when it makes sense and when it doesn't. All right, so that's our first question. Let's go take a look at our next one. Define a function, make extents, that consumes a number and produces a new list of two numbers, representing the negative version of that number and the positive version of that number. If the argument is a negative, make sure that the list's order is still negative positive. And if the number is zero, return an empty list. All right, so that's pretty weird. Let's import our cert equal as we always do because we're writing a function and take a look at what that looks like. So we're going to have our make extents function and it's going to consume a single number like say oh, seven and it returns a list, right? When it's done, it's going to have a list value and that list should be negative seven, seven. All right, that's relatively straightforward. It's always going to produce this list of length two. Now the Next test case, we're going to do something a bit different. We're going to pass in negative 3. This time, it's going to produce negative 3, 3. So the order is still negative, positive. Always length 2, though, with one exception. And that exception is going to be 0. If someone passes in 0, we don't do negative 0, 0, because there is no negative 0. We just do the empty list. So this time, it's not length 2. So we've got three pretty good test cases here to show off the behavior. Let's go ahead and actually write the function. Now this function, uh, it's going to consume a single integer, not a list like the previous function. So we already know how to do that. If we have make extents, we pass in a single number, and that's a type integer. It returns, however, a list of integers. And we don't have to say that it's a list of integers length two. We just say that it's a list of integers. What does the actual body do? Well, in a perfect easy world, we could just say, oh, return a new list where the first number is the negative version and the second number is the positive version. If we did that, we'd actually pass one of our test cases, the first test case uh, that would produce the list negative seven, seven. If I step through my code, you can see we, we go into the function, make extents, we do negative seven, for the right, left value, and then for the second value, we do seven. We end up just returning negative seven, seven, and that matches with the expected value. 
So all of that works out just fine. Cool. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for the second one. If you step through the code, you'd see that we end up with negative three, or rather negative negative three, which produces positive three, and three be, rather than, uh, sorry, and negative three, which is incorrect. In fact, it's the opposite of what we wanted. It should be negative three, three. We need to do something different if the number that we are given is a, uh, a negative number. So uh, let me make sure I disable my Steam before something weird pops up. Had to happen, right, when I'm recording the video. All right, so now we're going to be doing a if statement to handle the different cases. If, if a number is less than 0, we're going to do something different. If the number is greater than zero, we need to do something different. And we also have the case, what if it actually is zero? We need to do something different. So we've got three outcomes here, depending on what's passed in. We already know the positive outcome case. That, that, one's, that one's we've already handled, right? It's just return negative number, a number. OK? But what about this other case where we are passing in uh, a negative number? See, that one, we can be a little sneaky. Instead of making this number negative, we make the other number negative. And because we know that a number in this case is negative, that means that we get to have a negative times a negative, which is a positive. And this becomes a negative because it was already negative. This becomes a positive. So now they're in the right order. That just leaves our last condition. Now, if we were careless and just ran this, we'd still fail our last test case because it'd say the value is none, right? We're not doing anything in this else case, which means that we have no value returned. We don't want to return none. We want to return the empty list. Those are two different things. They are not equivalent, right? Zero is not equal to the empty list. Zero is not equal to none. The empty list is not equal to none. The empty string is not equal to zero. They're all different types of things, so they have different values. So I have to return the empty list in order to match that case. And now we're passing all of our test cases. Now at this point in time, I'm going to ask you a question. And that question, you may or may not be ready for it, but I'm going to ask you for it anyway. Uh, we have this code over here. Dog heights equals 22, 24, 20. And I want to add a new value to the list. And it turns out that there's a way to do that. And it's one of these answers down below. A, B, C, D, or E. So I'm going to pause the video right now, and I want you to tell me how do I add 27 to the list? All right. Let's move on to the next question, then. Uh, this one has us looking at a list of numbers. And this time, instead of asking us to define a function, they want us to print out each of the students' grades below. They're also going to have us say whether they passed, which is greater than or equal to 70, or if they failed, which is less than 70. Now, if you were sneaky, uh, you might just say, OK, they want me to print out the students' grades. Sure, I will print out the students' grades. If you do that, it puts out the numbers 100, 33, 90, 44, 85, and 99, which is sort of what they asked for. But they also wanted us to uh, say whether they passed or failed. They also probably didn't want us to print out all of the students' grades on one line. They probably wanted us to print them out each on their own separate line. So how do we do that? Ah, we could just write students' grades 0, and then students' grades 1, and 2, and 3, and 4. All right, easy peasy. Oh, no, wait, we forgot the 99. No problem, I'll just add another one. Great. I just had to add one more line of code, and I could print out the next element. But oh no, someone comes along and says, uh, Dr. Bart, one of your students got a 1. Oh no, that's not a good grade. But more importantly, I also have to add another line of code. Every time I get a new student, I'm going to have to go and add another line of code. I shouldn't have picked 7. That's too on the nose. I'd have to add 7. And that works, right? Like, but, I, but I'm going to be playing this game where I'm trying to stay ahead of the people adding to the list. That's, that's no way to live. That's not good. So I don't want to have to spell out, you know, oh, this index and this index. No, I'd much rather have some other way of being able to say, 
hey, just go print out each one of those things. Well, it turns out Python has a mechanism, and that mechanism is for loops. We love for loops. They're the next best thing in the world. We're able to say things like for grade in students' grades, print the grade. When I run this code, you'll see that it does the exact same thing the old code did, but with many fewer lines. We're able to print out each of the grades one after the other. How does it do this? Well, it's iterating through. We have students' grades, which is a list of values. We create a new variable called grade, and then we're going to print out that grade one line at a time. If we step through it, we create the list of how many values now? Eight values? Yeah, eight values. And then we iterate through each one in turn. So we get the list, and the first value is 100. So we store 100 over in grade. And then we print grade, which is 100. OK, then we loop again. The next value is 33. So that gets updated in grade, now having 33. We update, uh, we print the next value, and we loop again. Now it's 90. Then it'll be 44, and then 85, and then 99. How many loop iterations are there? One for each number in the list, which in this case is 8. Cool. So that prints out all the values. Now, a for loop has a body, right? It's just like an if statement, just like a function. When we have a body, we're allowed to put any number of lines of code in there. So the next grade is can be placed in there as a line. We can also put other bodies in there. So we could say, hey, if the grade is greater than or equal to, oh, sorry, if grade is equal to, greater than or equal to 70, then print past. Let's make sure we match it exactly. Otherwise, print failed. All right. So this time we run it again, and you see it prints out multiple lines. One for each, or rather, yeah, one for each. So the next grade is 100 passed. The next grade is 33 failed. The next grade is 90 passed. The next grade is 44 failed. The next grade is 85 passed. The next grade is 99 passed, right? So we went through the whole thing, and Python's more than happy to just keep printing out each line. If we debug it, you can see we, we step through. First, oh, sorry, it went through too fast. Meant to go a little bit slower. We step into it. The uh, next line of code after this one, the value of grade is 100. We print out the statement, the expression, I should say. Then we print out the next one, which is 100. Then we choose to, uh, we, we evaluate this expression. It's true. So we choose to execute line 11. And that means we print out passed. Once we're done that one, we're finished that if statement. So we skip over lines 12 and 13, coming back up to line 7. This time, when the value of grade is 33, we don't skip over the else statement. We do skip over line 11. So we go and execute line 13. And when it's done, we loop back up. Right? So it's really important that you understand this returning to the top of the loop behavior. It's, it's the big part of how for loops work, is returning us inside of it. Now, uh, there's a lot more to be said about for loops. First, I just want to ask a question to you about what we can do with these. So follow-up question. We have this list student grades, right? We, we took this list of integers, and we stored it in students' grades. And then I said, for a grade in students' grades, what is the type of the iteration variable a grade in the code? What is the type? And I have four options, integer, list, value, and string. So once again, I'm going to pause the video. OK, we have one last thing to look at here. I've written a function called make negative, And I've done something wrong inside of it. I've done something incorrect. Now, what did I do? In All right, make negative is a function, I claim, but I made something, I made a mistake during it. What did I do wrong? Well, we'll probably see in a second. But the idea of the function is that it should take in a number and make sure that it's the negative version of that number. So if the number is positive, 
it returns the negative version of the negative number, thereby making it positive. Uh, sorry, thereby making it, sorry, if the number is positive, then return the negative version of it, therefore making it negative. If the number passed in is negative, then we return that number, which is already negative. So in theory, when we pass in 5, make negative produces negative 5. And we pass in uh, 3, make negative produces the value negative 3. With make negative 2, we end up with just negative 2. But it looks like we forgot a case, the case of 0. If we run this code, you'll notice that I ended up with this solution, right? When I print out the values, I have negative 5, negative 3, none, negative 2. So I didn't handle that case. What happened? Python has to do something, right? Like it can't just be like, oh, I'm not going to do anything. It has to return a value, and it always defaults to returning none if it doesn't know what to do. So in this case of 5, it ended up re returning negative 5. In the case of 3, it ends up returning the value negative 3. But in the case of 0, when it goes through the cases, it says, oh, 0 is not greater than 0. And it says, oh, 0 is not less than 0. OK, I better return the value none, because it has to come back with something. The last one, negative 2. Negative 2 is not greater than 0, but it is less than 0. So we end up with true and the value negative 2 returned. Happy to put that in the list. Negative 5, negative 3, neg none, and negative 2. Now, why am I showing you this? Why do, why do we care? First, I want to highlight how easy it is to accidentally end up with a none in your code. Right? You call a function, you think you handled all the cases, but you, you made a simple mistake, forgetting the uh, zero case or the base case or something else. It happens to everyone all the time. When you do that, it often ends up returning none. And when you see the none, your first thought is, aha, I bet I'm expecting a function to return a value and it's not returning a value. Could be because you defined the function wrong or because the function's not supposed to return a value. It's hard to say unless you look at the specifics of that situation. The other thing to highlight is that fun uh, lists in Python can actually take in different types of values. And that's terrifying. That's horrifying. We're allowed to put any number of things, any number, any number of types of things inside a list. And that's the source of a lot of errors, right? It, it's a very easy mistake to make. Suddenly start mixing types. We're going to promise each other we're never going to do that because we're good, wholesome people. And we don't try and mix our types inside of our lists in Python because it's a recipe for disaster. So as long as you're trying to avoid doing that, life will be good, especially since you now have lists and loops.